Welcome to the Nordic Mythology Podcast. I'm Daniel Farron, corner of Kune Horns of Odin, and I'm joined, as always, by Dr. Matthias Nordvig. Hello, everybody. We are joined this time by Professor Marcin Carver of the University of York. Uh, you may know him from such uh, magnanimous excavations as the Sutton Who burial and also Port Mahomac in Scotland. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Carver. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm sorry to be uh, awkward and ask for this time, because uh, I know it's not your <laughs> usual time. But anyway, uh, um, thank you for coming. Oh, it's it's fine. Don't worry. We're, there's only certain guests that we're happy to move around for, and you're one of them. So <laughs> okay, <fine. laughs> no, I mean, thank you for joining us again. It's the second time time you've kind of appeared on the show and um, for anybody who hasn't already listened to the Sutton Who episode please go back and listen to that it is it's a really it's one of my favorite episodes um because I think you just like like you said before we started you just go off and talk and I can just sit and listen to, to you speak for as long as we need to so it's uh it's a really fun episode for me so should we should we get into Paul Mahomic um we're going to go north of the border. I like it. I was just saying before the show that my first ever hearing of Paul Mamuk was from the Viking Britain book with Thomas Williams, I think was the, the author. Um, and there was just a little bit in there about how there was a Viking raid on the on the monastery. But I, I your name popped up and obviously we did the Sun Who episode and I was like, okay, we need to we need to delve deeper into this, I think. Okay. So, I mean, for me, I think if we start at what the monastery was, I guess, because it was it was a Pictish monastery. Yeah, it right? was. I mean, I, I, perhaps I could start a bit a bit earlier than that because after Sutton Who, I'd um, uh, at Sutton Who, I'd explored the origins of one of these kingdoms, of which uh, there are quite a few in Britain. Um, people know about the English ones because they're called things like. Uh, Wessex and Mercia and Northumbria and East Anglia and so on. Uh, but the one, as soon as you get north of the border, of course, wasn't a border then. But if you if you go up to the end of the island, the north end, um, you get the Picts on the right hand side. Uh, um, that is to say, the uh, east, and you get the Scots on the left hand side. That's to say, the west. Mm -hmm. So the Scots are receiving. Um, immigration from Ireland, just as the uh, British in the south are receiving immigration from from England. And so it, it needs a sort of balancing up, you see what I mean? I, I think everyone always talks about the Anglo-Saxons, but they don't really talk about the British and they're super interesting. And also uh, in many ways in advance of the um, early English in, in their, uh, their politics, if I can put it that way. But anyway, we discovered some really interesting things about uh, the way that Britain works by going north. And uh, I, I was born in Scotland, so it was a, a long ambition to try to get back there. Um, um, so, because I left, um, I left Glasgow when I was about one, and uh, and uh, had to go, had to go. I was brought up abroad after that, and then. Um, school and you know everything and i was <laughs> at the army so it was lovely to go back to scotland and uh, uh, it, it was um just chance as, as it often is I, 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 there's very few things i've done in archaeology that, that haven't been just good luck really rather than good organization um this was um a telephone call came down from um the the, the northeast was sort of just the northeast town is Inverness, and above it you get Tain. And mm -hmm. uh, there was somebody living near Tain just just uh, rang me up and said, um, uh, "I just met your aunt uh, after crashing my car because because I um, it was near her house." <laughs> so I went, oh, wow. we got talking, and I said, uh, "This is this is uh, Caroline Shepherd Barron." She was called. She said, "I've said." Uh, I'm looking for an archaeologist. I don't suppose you know one. They say, oh, yeah, we know. We've got a relative who's an archaeologist. So she said, oh, well, uh, give me the telephone number. I'll ring him up. So I mean, what are the chances of 
I, I mean, maybe if he was like a, a plumber or or an electrician, something like that. But I feel like an archaeologist is a very niche thing to just stumble upon. But anyway, uh, it was just at the same time as I was looking for a chance to go north after Sutton Hoo to look at the right the other end of the country to see how their kingdom was forming. And also when they were converted to Christianity and what that meant to them. Because these are the sort of big moments that happened in the 6th, 7th, 8th century. And uh, so she rang up and said, um, I've got a church, which I, I can't get a grant for my church to, to repair it. And um, I, I've asked the various government bodies and so on. And they said, oh, my church wasn't interesting enough. I said, oh, that's <laughs> I'm sure it's really interesting. So she said to them, what, 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 what can I do about this? They said, oh, well, I should find an archaeologist. I mean, they'll say anything, you know, if you give them enough money. <laughs> 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 so, so she rang me up and said, come and have a look. So I did. So your and, job was to make the church more interesting. Well, I, I mean, I didn't take that as my brief, frankly. I, I, just <laughs> wanted, I was looking for somewhere where there was enough strata really but enough chances of a story because mm -hmm. if it's just a church it's a church okay it's founded and then it's occupied and so on but i had to see whether there was enough um uh, archaeological strata enough layers it, time has to pass otherwise we don't get a story so i went up there and she showed me around and i looked at the site and it was very beautiful uh it's on a peninsula so the peninsula sticks out between the Murray Firth and the Cromarty Firth and mm -hmm. um, on the <clears throat> west side there's a beautiful curving beach so I thought hmm curving beach that sounds like some, where somebody lands and uh, uh, it's been there for a long time so that's probably uh, a place that's occupied and then um, it uh, I read about the church that it did people had been up there in the 18th century and the 19th century and found bits of carved stone and the bits of carved stone were were put in the church and um, they stayed there until an antiquary arrived in 1906 and found them mm -hmm. and then they got noted and they got published and so on so I, I looked those up and I thought well that's interesting these are really very smart pieces of carving and one of them or uniquely in Pickland had a Latin inscription on it. So, mm. you know, it looks like, hey, this is interesting. This is, you don't get Latin inscriptions um, uh, unless it's a monastery and therefore it could be a monastery. And there were no monasteries in Pickland at this time. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a, uh, something in Adam's life of Columbus said that the Picts had had monasteries, but no one had ever managed to find one. So I thought, well, this looks pretty interesting. And then standing on the, hill looking down to the church and beyond it to the Cromarty Firth. Um, I, I, should I say Cromarty Firth? I don't mean the Cromarty Firth, do I? I mean the one up, up above that. Hang on, this is, this, this is my, my uh, anyway, anyway, the Firth um, goes across to Dunrobin Castle mm -hmm. and um, it's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful place. Not very well, po not densely populated, good farmland really good mm -hmm. farmer so the picts are there um in in some of the best land in scotland and they're going to be there they're documented as being there uh, between round about the third century a.d and the ninth century when they get uh they get whopped by the vikings and then by the scots in that order so yeah. there's just this little window and it's and it seemed to be opening at this place, Port Mahomac. So Port Mahomac is the port of St. Coleman. And there are lots of Colemans in the, in the lives of the saints, but this, this was a, a, almost certainly the one that was at the Synod of Whitby. So an imp important character went off to Ireland after that. But all that was very exciting. And uh, I went and saw some more picture sculpture. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but they, it's a very exciting kind of carving uh, the Christian ones have a cross on one side, sure, but before they're Christians, they just have symbols. And these symbols mm -hmm. are out of this world. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a thing that's sort of called the swimming elephant, 
because uh, it's got a sort of long trunk and it actually a dolphin, I think is probably what it is. And they've got oh. salmon, stags, cattle, mm -hmm. calves, all those things carved on it. And, uh, and, and these symbols are thought to be a way of spelling somebody's name. Mm -hmm. um, these little and these stones stand at the edge of somebody's land. So the Picts don't have the writing, but they have a symbolic uh, method of saying, uh, this is the land of so-and-so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we uh, would, we, oh, go on, Matthias. Uh, forgive me if this is a bit of a diversion, but um, do, do, we, do we know where the name Picts come from and and whether these people that we call Picts actually would have used that about themselves? I remember the word from Isidore of Sevilla. He is writing in the 700s and, and claims that that they're called Picts because they tattoo, right? So that's the the old trope of, of tattooing that is attached to them, which, I mean, we is possible, but we don't know if they were doing that. Um, but how, how long is that the tradition of the name, so to speak? And, and, and is it ever one that they actually use themselves if, if we can even uh, say anything about that? <laughs> I think I think they I think we can um, like a lot of things in that period uh, they don't get written down until the Romans come and then the Romans write down the names of the people that they're busy conquering and mm -hmm. give them a nickname uh, so the the Saxons just means that kind of long knife um, mm -hmm. uh, Vikings is another is another nickname I mean it's, it's like bikers or something they don't there's not mm -hmm. doesn't actually refer to a particular group with a particular activity mm -hmm. the pics were the picty the painted ones because they uh, as you say they tattooed themselves and i think we're pretty sure that did actually happen mm -hmm. and then sometimes happens um a, a group of people mainly tribal they find themselves and, and they find their own identity and they find their own kingdom really in, in you know within the the eighth century uh, particularly when they are converted to Christianity, which uh, we now know the Picts were too in the 8th century. So they become literate too. And they don't mind what they, they don't mind me called Picty then. It's, you know, mm -hmm. it's sort of like a bit of a trope, a bit of a bit of a flag to wave. So I think they did refer to, in the later period, I think they did, they did know that they were called the Picts and they were called the Picts by, um, by Bede as well. Okay, he was a pretty classical guy and mm -hmm. read a lot. But all the same, you know, they by that time they they knew each other, and they're not completely remote, as we know from Bede, because various kind of um, upper class folk sent their um, uh, daughters or, or or sons into 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 the care of the Picts when there was a lot of wars going on between the kingdoms, but. Um, I, I, I just felt that not enough was known about them, you know, and mm -hmm. the sculpture on its own is attractive enough to make you wonder about them. You know, really superb artists about which all we have is rumours, mm -hmm. strange rumours. <laughs> Their yeah. strange behaviours often happens to people who aren't known, known very well. Yeah. But to, yeah. to come back to the quick, I mean, the, the, the Picts are Britons. They're, they're just another lot of Britons that, that live in Britain. Um, mm -hmm. their, their distinction was that they never really got conquered by the Romans. Romans right. basically okay. gave up, it was just too difficult. <laughs> they were always getting into the, uh, into the Caledonian forests and being um, ambushed and, and so on. Have you, have you read, um, well actually there's a good film as well about the um, Eagle of the Ninth, you know, the, the Roman, uh, Ninth Legion went up to um, teach the Picts a lesson and completely disappeared. I think I've actually seen that movie. There was a, um, there was a, there was a movie. I'm trying to remember who was in it. Um, isn't it called something with the eagle or something like that? Yeah, is, or is it just eagle called of Eagle? Ninth, eagle of the Ninth. It's called. And he, yes. he spent the film looking for this eagle. Yes. Yes. And, exactly. And, and trying to get it to to really to satisfy everybody that his father was a hero rather than a coward. Mm -hmm. and, yes. Uh, he does this amazing last stand in the middle of a river holding mm -hmm. and the, the six of them all the legionnaires that survived 
and mm -hmm. and him whose name I can't remember what the actor's name, but he he defends the eagle, and against about four hundred Picts and slaughters a lot of them, mm -hmm. with dexterous sword work, <laughs> extremely dexterous. I think we can say. So. <laughs> yes. But, but we must not digress. Otherwise, we'll never even get to Fort Muhammad. No, so, I, I I was going to actually just say that um, me and Sarah was were up in that region. Um, in January, I think it was. Um, and I had the pleasure of seeing a few of the stones. We couldn't see all of them because, unfortunately, Dunrobin Castle, the grounds were closed at the time. I didn't realise I, I, I didn't realize that there was a, a seasonal thing. I assumed they would be open all year, but apparently it only opens kind of in the spring through through autumn time. So we saw the ones that were, were outside and accessible. So there's the one that's in the glass cabin and, I, um, and then I think there's one that was a remake and then one inside a church. So I managed to see a couple of them and they are pretty, pretty remarkable. They're, um, they say that it's, it takes an extreme craftsmanship to, to make them. They're not, I couldn't believe how, the detail on them when I actually saw them. I was quite expecting them to be, to be fairly simple. Um, but no, I was, I was wrong and ple well, pleasantly they, surprised. They the sixth century ones are fairly simple because they're incised. Later on, they're in low relief, so they're they're quite they're quite uh, uh, they're, they're very well made. But the thing is that the, the the symbolism is quite complicated. You know, it's really difficult to decode. Mm -hmm. And even when you get the um, the later sculpture, you know, they they do pretty pretty original things like. Um, uh, you know, King David and and um, and so on uh, on on their stones. So, yeah, I think they are fantastic and not very well known. Uh, but the people who know them are very passionate about them. So, Pictish Art Society, for example, is a a really passionate group of enthusiasts. Anyway, to to get back to the story, mm -hmm. I was I was in Fort Mahomet being shown round, and and I could see these sculptures were eighth century. And one of them was had got latin on uh, but also looking looking at the land it, it was pretty obvious that there was um uh, a filled in valley and um that's a that's the joy uh, for an archaeologist because if the valley's filled in the chances are that the strata are still there and they haven't been plowed away by the farmers uh, whereas on a flat uh, you know the, some of these settlements on the flat particularly on the chalk it gets plowed, 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 and there's hardly anything left, just the holes of the post holes. So we were excited about that and did some test excavations to see whether there was um, any strata there. And down, down it went. So it looked pretty, pretty positive. Mm -hmm. Then we did lots of um, survey work because these days, you, what you tend to do if you want to get a project going is you do an evaluation. Ours was paid by the Highland Council. Uh, we do an evaluation and then that gives you an idea of how good the site is. And then you present that to um, some fee paying or grant giving body and say, look, we know enough now to say hey, there's a lot of chances this is going to be a really good sequence. Mm -hmm. And we were helped. Uh, I'd, I'd tell you a funny story because we, we had a lot of gadgetry up there. Uh, we tried radar as well as magnetometry and so on. And um, we were running our, our machine through uh, through these fields. Uh, anyway, the guy who used to um, plow the fields lived just locally in his cottage, retired. Uh, and he'd, he'd come out each morning around about 10 o'clock to have his morning cigarette. And he, he'd, he'd stand there and, and smoke and look at us. And I went and chatted him up one day and he said, um, what are you doing? And so I said, well, you know, in a, in a slightly sort of superior way, these are important scientific uh, <laughs> We're trying to find um, early buildings. Anyway, it was, it was, this guy was a bit like Dave Allen. There was a long pause and he went, do you want to know where they are? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't mind, actually. If it say, you come with me. So we walked into the middle of the fields and he said, dig here, I should. And <laughs> I said, how do you know? He said, well, it's not complicated. Uh, I've, been, <laughs> I've been plowing this land for the last 40 years. It's a sharp sand. There's only really these places where you hit large 
round stones. And that's here. That has to be a building. What else could it be? So there we go. So I dug I, that. Uh, I wonder how many interesting people there are like that, who, yeah. who nobody ever speaks to, I guess, but you just know these things first. on the land. <laughs> The only, you know, it's actually, um, there, there's a lot of that, stories like that in Denmark, you know, where it's like, oh, over here, the locals have been talking about that there's like a king's wagon that has been like, you know, lost in a bog and, and then they go digging and they actually find a, 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 a beautifully adorned wagon from, you know, 1800 years before <laughs> those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Like it, it's, uh, it's definitely like local, local information like that is, is very valuable to Absolutely. finding things. Yeah. You know, just as just as good as a magnetometer, and but in this case also uh, being an area where I I I'd never been before, um, and and the, it was really important to um, get people on your side. After all, it's a, you know it's a, it's a farmland that they're mm -hmm. going to make a living, and there has to be a very good reason. You can get permission from the landowner who might even live live in London, but when it comes to the permission you actually want it's from the tenant farmer um, yeah and so you you have to cut you have to make sure you've got them on your side and we we did find that the the the, the port as it's called was very very friendly they were terribly nice to us yeah. they gave us enormous feasts and there was lots of drinking so it was a smashing place to be um we i put in a uh, we did the evaluation i put in a bid for the um for the lottery money. So remember that the own, the um, person who had invited me was the one who was trying to get her church restored. And um, she had, she wanted to raise the money for that and was having trouble getting the grant. So uh, we decided we put in for a lottery grant and uh, lottery was, was a bit more straightforward in those days than it is now. It's become quite, quite difficult and competitive, but those days, they were really looking for projects, you know, to, to spend the money on. And um, mm -hmm. we put together um, three partners. So the Tarbot Historic Trust was the trust that the local people who, who were going to uh, make the church uh, repaired and restore it. Highland Council, uh, who, whose area we were in, and the University of York. So we all wanted different things. The, um, uh, basically, the Tarbot Historic Trust wanted to restore their church and, and make a car park. Uh, <laughs> Island Council wanted to um, make a, an area of um, uh, tourist attraction, uh, try and attract people to the Tarbot Peninsula, which is, you know, it's a 20 mile road leading nowhere, leads to a lighthouse. And so it's quite hard to get people up there. And there, was a, there were a few hotels there. They kept getting into trouble financially, not enough people coming and so on. And of course, they don't come in the winter, as you as you found out. The, the I, 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 it's quite I, short, actually. Up there. I did. It was a. I mean, it was a beautiful drive out there. But you're right that there isn't much between the two points when you when you kind of leave the main oh, road to, to head in that direction. Yeah. It's it's pretty much just a, a one little road, and that's then that's it. Well, we got we got our our three organisations together and decided that what we'd do is we'd. Um, we dig, we dig the site, um, and then uh, we get the church restored, and then uh, we put the, we make the church into a museum, and put the, our finds into the museum, and that would give it um, a long destiny, a long life. And in fact, it's still going. It's it it is a museum. Mm -hmm. It can also function as a church, but it's a, but it's a, it's a, it's still going. It's still getting public. When you think how far the, how they have how difficult it is to find it's quite amazing they've kept going but they've done really 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 well i know i, w I wish they were open when i went <laughs> that was yeah. that was my destination for driving out there um and we actually we got i mean it, it's lovely to see anyway it's a beautiful area but we we got out and went up to the church and had a little knock on the door and there was nobody there did you, did you wind the handle did you see those posts there's, there's no posts up. well there's some post sticking up there and they talk to you if you wind the hand oh i did yes no i did yeah. i did see them I, I did saying something out of that post oh is it you it is yeah <laughs> so anyway we started building the museum almost immediately because uh, obviously our partners uh, 
the local partners were the ones that wanted that uh, particularly done and and reply to the heritage lottery the lot, heritage lottery only give you money if you've got a community uh, benefit it, it can't just be research in fact they did say we don't really fund research so uh, we'll leave aside the excavation i said well you can't leave aside the excavation because it's part of the deal it's part without the excavation you don't get a museum they said well we know what your archaeologists are like you know once you're in there you'll we'll never get rid of you i said well you will actually because <laughs> things have changed a lot in the world of archaeology and you want to look at an archaeological project now quite differently it's like building a house we do an evaluation season we've done that already so we know roughly what what what's here and then when we uh, um look at the program we make a program which is has a specific purpose and our program is uh, to chronicle the the different phases of this site and use those phases to determine when kingdoms were formed when uh, the people were converted to christianity how they did it what context they had with um the rest of britain and across the sea if we if we're lucky enough and then what happens in the Middle Ages, and then what happens right up to today. So we've got a, a prize sequence here. So this story is a good story, but it's no one has else has done this yet in Scotland. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the picks are, are, are really elusive. Uh, everybody's heard of them, but when you when you actually want to get face to face with them, that's a bit hard, apart from the sculpture. So, so they said, "Oh, I see. So you mean?" You just have a, a program. I said, yeah, we have a, we have a, we have a single price, just like building a house, and that's it. So, um, well, it wasn't, of course, but I mean that was. <laughs> <laughs> so I said that they said, okay, that's fine. So they gave us, um, uh, well, they gave us, I think, two and a half million, which of which only a bit was for the dig. The rest of it was for restoring the church and um, starting to make it into something which people wanted to visit, building the car park, all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. So we, they started um, uh, getting the ch church. was beautifully designed, by the way. It's, it's, uh, if you get a chance to go there, do, do go in. Um, it's, uh, it's been converted into a museum in a very tasteful way, I think. And it's got a gallery upstairs, things for children, all sorts of things. It's very nice. And we opened this in, uh, what was it, 1999, um, and uh, Prince Charles came to open it. And oh, wow. uh, he was actually very, very good. I, I didn't, um, I, I, to be honest, I chose Billy Connolly as my favorite person to open this. <laughs> well, he's, he's pretty good at history, you know. I mean, he, he's done some nice programs on the history of Scotland. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, you didn't tell Prince Charles that, though, did you? No, well, I think <laughs> when he came, actually, I think, but, is, yeah. but the point was that the Tarbot Historic Trust was quite certain they wanted Prince Charles for the very good reason that if you get royalty, all the street lamps get mended. Oh, and, really? Yeah, but they, they probably wouldn't do it for Billy, you see. <laughs> <laughs> so all these things, these are, the, these are the politics of trying to get a project going. But anyway, mm -hmm. we got it going. And... Uh, Prince Charles came and in helicopter and um, he was very really nice and everybody loved it. So that was a great success. And then we got down to the digging. So we dug the area. We couldn't dig the churchyard. I have to explain that because in Scotland, you can't dig a churchyard without mm. the permission of all the descendants of that, oh, okay. the people buried there. They, they, they allocated layers, they called them. And these layers, um, last forever so a lot of scots emigrated of course and went to canada and all sorts of places um very difficult to track down mm -hmm. apart from the fact that um an awful lot of them called ross in that in that part of the world ross and mackenzie you know there are, there's a lot of people with the same name and so it's really hard to find if you if you wanted to track them down and so mm -hmm. we avoided and to make as a curious little fun fact to make it matters even more complicated, Mackenzie over here in America is also a first name. Oh, so you, you find a lot of, <laughs> I, I've always been sort of puzzled by that. <laughs> yes. No, well, uh, anyway, the, the thing is that um, the, 
churchyard was we could map it okay because it had the standing stones uh, right up to well 20th century so we, we, the earliest ones were 13th 14th century so we could map the way the churchyard had had expanded and we were also interested in the environment you know we wanted to to have a have a feeling for where our site was however let me just tell you if i can quickly and interrupt me if you if if i lose the thread uh, basically there are four acts in this drama um the earliest occupation was in the sixth century sixth into the early seventh century and we found it firstly in the form of big slabbed tombs these these were long kissed burials or kiss they call that in scotland but they're basically um uh, slabs of stone set on edge and a slab going over the top and then the, the person is laid inside and mm -hmm. they're quite high status uh, so we found two little groups of these um, of course everything is found backwards in uh, archaeology but, but I'm going to tell you the story um, in real time so to speak rather than uh, start from today and, and, and deal yeah. down with you <laughs> mm -hmm. okay so, so the earliest phase is this um phase which is looks like being quite aristocratic um okay. uh, don't they didn't have a church or anything like that uh, in fact they they did have a settlement and the settlement part that, that we in our area was um uh, uh, just at the edge of a marshy um uh, a place where a stream was coming down so they had fresh water supply mm -hmm. uh, and they were making things they were uh, they had a uh, gilt bronze disc um, and that gilt bronze disc was um, had animal ornament on it so that was an exciting find mm -hmm. um, and then uh, i realized that that one was rather similar to our mound 17 gilt bronze disc in other words it's a disc from a bridal and then we, uh, I noted another one was another one at Dunad, another one at Market Motive Mark. So we were right on the on the right north end of Britain. Sutton, who was on the south end of Britain, uh, Dunad was on the west of Britain. Motive Mark was uh, right Solway Firth. Amazing, and they're all mm -hmm. having the same kind of bridal. So it seemed as though in the sixth to the early seventh century there was a kind of uh equestrian class occupying <laughs> these different small settlements and if you go to the borders or go to wales you'll find loads of these small settlements on tops of hills um and very often they have a, a stone with them a, a some kind of inscription in the west they're already christian so they've got christian inscriptions and so on so this is like britain's heroic age uh which we contacted and it, it, it helped a lot because it said, ah, so the Picts really are Britain. So that's exactly what we were hoping mm -hmm. they would show themselves to be. And then, so uh, would, uh, yeah, go on. Would, would, because I, obviously this is the first, the first thing you said, there wasn't a church there. It was just these, these burials. Yeah. Um, so would the church then be put there because this is a significant spot because of these two, two burials? Or is it just a coincidence that a church is put there? It's 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 some it's not a coincidence, but it's not it's not logical either. I mean, basically, the the, the Tarbert Peninsula has got clusters of burials all the way around it, so it's like a, an island. And quite often in um, the west coast as well, in uh, in of Scotland, you get islands of the dead, so islands where people are buried. Um, and this is like. Port Mahomet had burials all the way, and it had them since the Bronze Age. We've got Bronze Age burials around there as well. Mm -hmm. However, what seems to have happened here is uh, there was uh, a bit of a hiatus, not very long, but uh, there, there, was a, there was a time when nothing much was happening. And then there was a big landscaping exercise. And what the, what the landscapers did was to um, build a road uh, which ran from the top of the hill above the beach uh, down to what had been a wet patch uh, but that turned into a pond 
a big pool. Um, and they they built um, retaining walls. Uh, the road, by the way, was was uh, metal. It was it was sort of rammed, uh, well slabs really slabs of schist that had been put in the road. So quite quite a novelty for our age. Mm -hmm. um, wow. And then uh, they built um, a church, and then they built a strange building which was uh, round at one end and and sort of square at the other. It's like a like a sporran in plan. Um, really, it's really interesting building uh, mm -hmm. with big post holes, and then uh, a porch. And the porch showed us that this building must have been made of turf. So. The building, the posts themselves were set at intervals and the building was clad in turf. Mm -hmm. And in that building, people were working metal. And then- Isn't, isn't there a shape like that on one of the, the picture stones? Almost, I don't know if this is offensive by saying it looks like a Cornish pasty kind of upside down. I'm sure that's on, on one of the, is that on one of the pictures? It's like a, a semicircle around the top and then it comes in. Uh, like flat oh, your symbol you mean is that what it is yeah there's a symbol yes yes yeah yes. One, of, one of those is a comb um i'm just trying to think what the one that you're thinking of but uh, there is there is a mirror and comb is a very common symbol oh, okay a pair, a pair of symbols in fact you yeah in the pictish symbolic language mm -hmm. um but there was another of these buildings uh also um of turf and in there uh we were very puzzled as to what they were doing in there they they had um they had bones sharpened at one end and they they were all put into a row um and then there was a trough stone line trough some description well it was a sort of rectangular stone line uh, there were some big stones that that stood about kind of chest high, and um, there were lots and lots and lots of white pebbles. <laughs> so my very clever co-director, Cecily, <laughs> looked at this and uh, she said, "Well, the other building is they're definitely making metalwork, work, beautiful metalwork. Uh, mm -hmm. Little bits of enamel and things we were finding, glass and so on." They said in this one, they're doing something which needs a trough and white pebbles and bones. <laughs> so I said, yes. And she said, oh, well, <laughs> it's they're making vellum. Well, that was an amazing piece of intuition. And she went off to Melton Mowbray, where they still make vellum and said, we think we've got a vellum making workshop oh. um, because we've got a trough which means that they've got something that they could uh, wash the skins in. Um, and we've also got, a, there was a lot of ash in this, uh, this trough. And this ash was uh, from uh, um, shells, seashells. In other words, they'd got an astringent. They didn't, they didn't have uh, what they have in the Mediterranean. So they used the seashells and burnt them. And that gave the alkali to make the astringent. And then oh, wow. they wanted to stretch them. And um, at this point, uh, Cecily found a very diagnostic knife, which was like a, a curved, had a curved blade and a, and a single uh, a sort of handle coming up like that. And these mm -hmm. are made to de wait, wait. Mesh, well, they made to de-hair leather, sorry. So, so, so it's like, it, it, it's a curved blade and then the, the handle is in the middle? Yeah. Yeah, and they use them to, they're, they're very characteristic of, of treating skin. So you, you scrape with this, mm -hmm. the curved blade pushes the skin down so that it keeps in contact with skin. Yeah. Like and you can, oh, it's, it's, it's just interesting because it sounds almost like the Ulu, uh, um, the Inuit Ulu uh, that they use for the same purposes um, to clean skin. Yeah. 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 Someone said a, a, a loon limb, loon limb. Yeah. Is that your class? Lelum, mm -hmm. moon shaped. Yeah. So, yeah. So that, that that's the that's the symbol I was talking about. That's not. I just googled it quickly. That's exactly oh. the symbol I I meant earlier when I said an upside down Cornish pasta. 
Yeah, I didn't realize there was one looking like that's very interesting, looking like a a, a, a lunellum. Uh, anyway, the the um, the bones were then a bit of a mystery. Uh, but when you got the skins, you clean them. You then have to put them on a stretch them on a frame, <laughs> and these these frames um, didn't exist because they were made of wood, so they mm -hmm. they disappeared. Uh, but the bone pegs were there, and basically you you peg the leather um, uh, to the frame so that it's uh, stretched tight. But you but you mustn't put a hole through it because if you do that, the hole will get bigger and bigger as you stretch it with the leather thong. So what do you do? Well, uh, Cecily uh, surmised and confirmed that what you do is you take the corner of the leather, you wrap it around a little pebble. And then you lash it and then tie it to the frame so that when you tighten it up, um, it doesn't tear. So basically, you've got something like a drum skin, uh, really, really tight. And then you scrape it, scrape it, scrape it, make it tight and put more uh, astring astringent on it and punch, I think it's called, and make that into a smooth writing surface. So that was an amazing piece of detective work. And there was a special building for doing it with its. Um, uh, trough next door and and this sort of pedestal which they could work the leather on and so mm -hmm. on it's so obviously very making... important to make it yeah well absolutely i mean they, they we, we we had a little bit of a problem trying to decide that it was really vellum rather than just leather working mm -hmm. um and and that was uh, I, I think it was sort of deduced really because of the um, young animals that were there being uh, used, um, and also uh, uh, the, the, the sort of finery of the of the of the knives. It it just looked a bit special, but I, I can't say we ever found. We didn't actually find a a nice codex in the pond, which would have been handy. <laughs> that's unfortunate. <laughs> would, would, have, would, would have proved the point. Um, so that's making metal, making uh, vellum. And then the metal working um, included uh, the kind of things that you see on the Ardar chalice. They're little like little bosses um, with, en with enamel on. And uh, so the plot was thickening, uh, basically towards the identification of a monastery. And mm -hmm. The third industry there was sculpture. And of course, we didn't really know about the sculpture until the Viking raid, because when the Vikings raided, they, they smashed all this sculpture up with a sledgehammer or something and, and used it to pave a road. So that we were finding these bits of sculpture, but it was in the wrong phase, you see what I mean? But when oh, it, we right. all got back into phase, we realized that this is all part of the same monastery. The monastic package was carving, stone carving, including a Latin inscription, but also other kinds of mixed Pictish imagery with Christian imagery, and then making church vessels, presumably from this metal workers uh, shop, and then making vellum. So um, it's as though the monastic package was too big just for one monastery. Uh, but what these monasteries do is you set up somewhere in a new place, and then they bud off into daughter yeah. houses, and you gradually expand the reach of Christianity like that. Mm -hmm. So we were pretty thrilled by this time because we thought, mm, well, this looks pretty like real Christians. And all the rumours about the Picts, um, uh, you know, um, never wearing any clothes. and uh, uh, <laughs> It sounds kind of ridiculous in Scotland. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a good place to be a nudist. That's absolutely <laughs> no, certainly not. <laughs> but, anyway, not, uh, not right out there as well by the sea. <laughs> What, what was brilliant was not only was this, you know, sort of um, uh, uh, brought them into the mainstream of the development of Britain, but it was actually better than anything Britain had got because um, for one reason or another, monastic sites tend to be um, remembered and popular and ours wasn't. Well, it was actually because it became a parish church, you know, later on, but mm -hmm. but it's not like, uh, you know, as a Westminster, it's not, it's not like... Uh, Lindisfarne or any of those, although Lindisfarne is deserted now, no one's forgotten it. Mm -hmm. And so it's uh, all, all those places have sort of stayed famous, 
and have either been developed or or been uh, development has been forbidden mm -hmm. so we were dead lucky to find something that we could not know what it was to start with but had a suspicion and then out the monastery so the monastery was first a sort of um dates we could it probably wasn't earlier than 680 so the end of the seventh century so it's basically in the same wave of monasticism which gave us jarrow monk weirmouth hartley pool uh, all, all these monasteries that appear in bead they're all of that period mm -hmm. and there's a massive monastic movement which starts in northumbria and spreads north and spreads west um which uh, in, it, we, we were inspired by Port Muhammad to realize that this is, was a very, very significant moment. It wasn't I mean, just... it's, it's obviously a long way north, so I guess you would assume that there must be places on the way, like you said earlier about how it kind of starts and spreads. Um, so for it to get to Port Muhammad, you would assume, I guess, there's would there be monasteries all the way up? Um, I think it's, um, you have to think... Um, boats really okay so it would that's why i was wondering whether it would have come around by sea or come up through the land distributions, yeah the, the distributions the ones we know tend to be on the water okay right and, okay and even getting to ireland uh you know you've got the great great glen you can get you can get there if you've got especially if you're if your irish sea type boats or skin boats you can carry them quite easily so you know you you, you come into the loch ness system and you end up in the Inver, um, Inverness I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure that's was the main form of transport especially as it's really hilly up there highlands mm -hmm. so if you plot the Vic Pictish stones the, the first type the incised type with just symbols on them no crosses they they tend to be in up country and basically they tend to occupy the place where uh, the sort of sown meets the wild part of the mountain. So mm. they're telling you that you've arrived at somebody's estate. Uh, but the ones with crosses on seem to be looking out to sea and mm -hmm. telling people who are coming by boat that this is what you're looking for. This is what the port of port. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the one that I remember seeing was the, the one. It, it's in like a glass case now, I guess, well, to stop shandy. it. That, yeah, yeah, that one obviously has a big cross on it and then on the other side it has the the kind of pictish symbols it does and it has the amazing 64 spiral explosion yes that is an <laughs> extraordinary piece of art it's, it's it's beautiful and i wish i could have like organized to get inside the glass case and get up close and have a have a good look because it's it's remarkable that it, of where it is me and sarah drove out to it and it's just this huge ornately carved stone just stood yeah. there in the middle of nowhere seemingly for no apparent reason apart from that it is looking out to the sea that's right and uh, in fact port muhammad sorry the the Tarmac peninsula has got these four sites on it um there's, there's shandwick and and then there is um nig and nig looks the other way it looks into the cromarty first and mm. uh, port muhammad looks into um the Murray Firth. Well, it looks across to uh, to um, Sutherland, um, and and those those places are all looking out to sea. So, it's, if Port Mahomet was a sorry, if uh, Tarn Peninsula was an island, these would be the points of entry that people would would recognise. And and these crosses, they made big cross slabs in the pits. Um, later artists made these big cross slabs. Mm -hmm. uh, so when the Vikings came and they seem to have come early ninth century, so they've already raided Lindisfarne in 793, but here they're coming 8, 800, 810, something like that. Um, East Coast Monastery, just what we're looking for. And uh, so the Vikings, um, I think uh, it, it isn't that they didn't like Christianity because they converted quite quickly, especially in Yorkshire, um, they didn't like monasticism. They did aim for the monasteries, but monasticism was um, something they thought was politically unacceptable. It's a bit like a Tory 
looking at socialism you know it's not it's not healthy in some way <laughs> whereas uh, the monastic movement thought that this was the only way to live where uh, you you invested in the power of the almighty and did lots of singing and so on um, but you also tried to make the kings subservient uh, to the monastic idea That's so this is this is a, an interesting conversation because um i don't know if you're familiar with uh the uh, i think his first name is johan Müller uh yeah. theory right about uh the viking raids on especially on northern uh like the the, the northern uh, british area uh, scotland and 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 northern england uh, being in some ways motivated by the conversion to christianity in that region um his original claim um which i think is a little too it, it's a little too much of a neat package to to be acceptable but uh, his original claim is that there was a long-standing uh, interaction between um, the Picts, for instance, um, uh, and uh, the Scandinavians, particularly in Norway. And these uh, interactions and trade collapsed when they converted to Christianity. And so the Viking raids are a response to that. Um, that's, his, that's his claim. It's, I think sort that, of roughly that's a, step, that's a step too far because we don't have the mm -hmm. evidence for trade yeah with norway at that point and in fact even um you know when the uh the norse came to to port marmot uh they left precious little of the kind of material culture that we have in um york masses and masses of stuff there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i think um i, I don't think it's trade but I, th I think people shouldn't underestimate um, the corrosive power of ideology, you know, any sort of ideology which uh, sort of sweeps across people um, like fire and they're all there, they all suddenly decide that these other people are very dangerous or they're not good for us or, or something. Mm -hmm. But if you want a more pragmatic reason, um, the monasteries were very rich, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, our monastery is miles from anywhere, uh, but that part of the world that time of Blizzard was never as rich again and it's never been as rich before you know it was mm -hmm. an amazing amount of investment because they made um uh, they'd encourage people to believe that the most important thing was salvation and um uh, uh, there was a writer whose name i can't remember now it was a very good um uh, article he wrote called the salvation industry which explains how early monasteries worked basically mm -hmm. you know you paid them for salvation and they got extremely wealthy mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that the port mohammed monastery was set up in a, a way that is actually documented by bead as well in other words the people who'd been living there already buried in those smart kissed burials they must have given the land they probably had other land but they gave the land as a monas as a monastic site and it was perfect because it was above the beach that you could land on and so on so mm -hmm. I, I, that and that and that all those other those kiss burials then disappeared and a completely new set of burials came with the with the monastery and, a, and a, mm -hmm. they had um stones placed either side of the head like that instead of being mm -hmm. big flabby uh, stones and two of them we, we did um, various kinds of uh, stable isotope analysis. Uh, uh, two of those people were from Scandinavia. So you don't, you don't need to have a trade um, that goes wrong. I mean, you, it'd be good if, it, if, if there had been one, if we've got evidence for it. But you do need to have um, a reason for um, destroying the monastic idea and substituting um what you might call i don't know single male domination or something i mean but the vikings were very keen on um uh you know family land owning with a with a, a fighter at, at its head this is what did in yorkshire they converted the monasteries of yorkshire and and removed them altogether. and instead of that you've got loads of private churches all over 
East Riding, and uh, they also had sculpture and all the rest of it. I, I, you know, it was another another way of doing things, but it was a very different way. So I think mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I've done a book. Okay. On I'm I'm getting excited about this <laughs> this theory. <laughs> so, so what what you're essentially proposing here is that there is a an ideological difference that ha doesn't have anything to do with necessarily have anything to do with uh, heathen versus Christian, but uh, but more uh, how do you organize um, your land ownership, for instance? So yeah. uh, something that we see from all over Scandinavia and particularly in Iceland is that. Yeah. Uh, churches are privately owned. Um, in the in the beginning, when when Christianity uh, emerges in in the Danish area, you have the same thing. You have privately owned churches, and then at some point, we have the Catholic Church ceasing uh, in, in some way or other the uh, the ownership of of of, uh, of the church institutions. Yeah. So what we have essentially is sort of like a, a Viking idea, a Scandinavian idea of how you uh, manage churches and church land as opposed to a the, the, the established catholic idea um and, and and governance in general yes no I, I i i like this perspective i think that's actually very reasonable i did uh, i did this book on formative britain um which is uh it's, it's rather it's rather large and no normal human wants to read it because it's far too big <laughs> but it, 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 if you go to just the last chapter <laughs> then, then you'll get the theme so it, it basically goes a bit like this that there are three driving forces in the first millennium um, the first one is uh, what you might call kingship or single male leadership of some description uh, where you put your faith in that person and you, and you become that part of that person's following and this is expressed in archaeological terms by small settlements, uh, very often on high places, and uh, carved stones with inscriptions on. So you get them in Cornwall, Wales, uh, the borderlands um, west of um, Britain, and in the east of Britain, they're, they're the symbol stones. That's their way of saying this is, this is our land. And they're placed at the front of the estates. Uh, as you come over the mountain and find them. So that, that's, that's one tendency, and it, it's very clear in the early period. The second tendency is to put your faith in spirituality of some kind. Um, I think Christian monasticism is a, quite an extreme form of spirituality because uh, it, it was originally invented in the Mediterranean uh, because the a Christian movement was trying to get out of imperial control and, and get out of imperial control and into uh, by trying to trumpet by saying we have a much more important emperor uh, and incidentally you won't be able to assassinate him either um, because he's not there mm -hmm. and so that's um, was a, that developed uh, you know in places like Monte Cassino and so on came north and it was embraced by the Northern British particularly. And I, I don't know why that was, but the English didn't like it. And I've been having a sort of various discussions with people about this because in my book, I'm saying that the English didn't actually have monasteries. Um, and although Bede thought he was English and he was in a monastery, they're really all in Northumbria at that stage uh, and they don't they don't come south till later when they do come south they come to places which are i don't know much where there are churches they're much more like the private churches uh, idea mm. and then the third um uh, imperative is wealth so the vikings are quite typical of this type of governance where in individual families equal to each other so they're not actually that interested in kings the vikings they're, they're interested in um uh, family power mm -hmm. and uh, they like to get land and build their own church put their own as you were saying put your own cross in there and those crosses um are really rather rather a giveaway because if you go to somewhere like middleton or, or what's it called nunbanholm um 
most crosses have a bit, bit of the Bible um, and uh, image of a saint, but these have an image of the landowner and he's sitting there on a chair <laughs> being sculpted <laughs> on the cross, you know, with his sword. So, so he's saying, yeah, this is, okay, that's God's uh, area and this is my area. And, and um, so now you know. <laughs> yeah, no, it makes, that makes a lot of sense. We've seen these ideas expressed in various imagery in Scandinavia too. Um, I think I need someone also... to do an image of me like that. I think <laughs> sat, sat in this chair right here. I think <laughs> would work perfect. And this, there's also you know, there's also something about the utility of of monasteries. Um, in a, it, I think it, we can safely say that it's a it's a good place to put your bastard children, um, and 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 other people you, that that you want to get rid of in a, in in the established Christian cultures in the Mediterranean, right? Um, but you don't have those same issues in Scandinavia. Um, a, a good example is is just how many uh, children of of priests and bishops in Iceland who are inheriting property, yeah. <laughs> like. They, they were not they were not particularly concerned with uh, the celibacy thing and in the same way we don't see in the in the early uh, laws that much of concern about uh, such things as adultery and so on so so you have a different culture in Scandinavia and the Scandinavians might have essentially just looked at these monasteries and been like what are they good for anyway except for you well, know they're raiding tying up wealth. <laughs> they're tying up wealth and yeah being taken out of the marketplace so that if you're yeah. interested in creating wealth then monsters aren't very good it's a good way of getting rid of any wealth but it doesn't actually help very much on the other right. hand when when they without the vikings they were already beginning to fade in the ninth century because the uh, what the things they invented were too useful so one a good example of this is the water mill. So the water mills are always present in the Irish monasteries. Uh, we thought we ought to have one at Port Mahomet, but we, we couldn't actually find it. We found, we found the mill pond, but I think the mill itself was under the road. I think that's its problem. But these things are really useful and they set themselves up. And so you wanted your, your grain ground and the monastery took a toll and ground it for you. So the intelligent um, aristocrat would see that uh, it'd be rather better if we ran this. And so uh, you know, one of the first people to, to have one was um, uh, in Tamworth. Offa's Palace had a, had a water mill. That's one of the few that have been found. So, mm. so you know, they're capturing some of the, the good technology that came with the monasteries, but they don't really want the other bit. They don't, they don't. They don't believe it, I suppose. That's the, that's the problem. That they don't believe they'll go to hell uh, unless they pay uh, for the salvation. You know, I think I think mm -hmm. that's the, and of course that meant for the next thousand years one long big argument between the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. You see? Mm -hmm. So that's why I think this. That's why I call it a formative period because I really don't believe it was a dark age. I really don't believe it was particularly irrelevant in fact i would say that's where european politics was you know, really invented i think that's where they tried out all these different ways of living absolutely and make up their minds about them it's still yeah no i i, I agree a lot uh, uh, calling it the dark age is uh is a uh, you know you know an affront to what it actually was it was a, it was a very innovative uh period in european history and one thing that's interesting too to see when it comes to this idea of like, what, how do you pay uh, to get into heaven in, yeah. in the early Christian period in Scandinavia? Um, quite often it's building a bridge. That's what we're seeing, especially in the Swedish area, but we also see it a bit in the Danish area. Um, there's some, the, the church is for some reason, it might be the church and whoever rules a certain plot of land that are uh, pushing the idea of like better infrastructure. So you see a lot of bridge building in Sweden in particular, uh, along with then putting up a rune stone that says, uh, I, I own this land and I built this bridge and I am Christian. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Well, they do have crosses, those ones, but, but you know, I think 
the, the, there's a feeling it starts a bit earlier than that when um, the famous um, uh, inscription on 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 the runestone uh, says something like um, uh, I, uh, uh, I I'm celebrating my daughter the handy girl of such and such a valley uh, who had the the responsibility for maintaining the road and the bridge you know that that's extraordinary uh, revelation and if, if only because they're women but you know that's uh, in that period that's that's quite something mm -hmm. so i think there was, there was a lot of um really interesting um what should i say sort of benefits coming from the argument that was happening in sweden between different kinds of governance and they, they didn't seem to cope they didn't plump for kingship it, it didn't seem to be particularly keen on kingship if you look at the bendel and belsiada burials i mean the a Swede won't say, oh, they're burials of kings or even aristocrats. You know, they're just good, wealthy farmers. And uh, so, yeah, it's very interesting, the Swedish case. And so if we took a sort of snapshot of the 8th century in, in Northwest Europe, oh, my God, it's diverse because everybody's mm -hmm. trying different things and they don't yet have to dominate each other. Mm -hmm. bad. No, that's and that's that that also changes depending on the landscape there are some areas that are easier to to govern uh by a dynasty right or or an emerging dynasty uh the danish area is a good example of that it, it does look like the, the danish area uh receives sort of more of like a steep hierarchy earlier yeah. than you get in norway for instance and farther north in sweden it also is evident in the vocabulary. There are several words for what we today would just call a king. Mm. Uh, there's the word konungur, which means king. That word uh, literally uh, signals uh, inherited uh, position, um, as opposed to drot, which means uh, warlord or something like that. Somebody who, who, who you know, marches with the army. Um, which was an, another very early term for for what we could otherwise translate to king. So it's it's very evident that, that that there are multiple forms of governance happening in Scandinavia and at different times and in different locations, depending on you know a bunch of variables. Really, it's actually quite fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Well, the Vikings came to Port Mahomet, of course. I mean, they they came in. Um, 810 and this was not a, a, ra a raid that was in the history books so uh, we had to work quite hard to prove it because the natural tendency of archaeologists is to be hugely skeptical about other archaeologists <laughs> and um, especially <laughs> they're claiming something like a viking raid we what we had though was um, the, the, the vellum workshop burnt down and all, all the areas around it burnt down so it had been very very hot and you could see the 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 different um uh temperatures it was it, 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 it was like technicolor you know it was really or psychedelic sort of mashes of swirls of orange and black oh, and, wow. yellow and so on so it was a really fierce fire um and then uh there was the breaking up of the sculpture so the sculpture had been broken up with a hammer um, that included um, lots of different kinds of monument which were no longer there. Mm -hmm. uh, the monuments that were still in one piece had been felled. Uh, so they were the ones around the church, basically. Um, but otherwise, the rest of them be. The pond was decommissioned. Uh, it was just blocked up with mud and they didn't bother with it. They obviously weren't interested in the mill still. Um, but... Um, uh, they did continue working there and the interesting thing is that they moved the metal workshop from the building where it was before and they, they moved it to where the vellum workers had been and they were working with crucibles and open hearths and things like that but they weren't making um, chalices and, and thermals and things like that mm. anymore they, they were making uh, belt buckles and um, uh, basically secular apparatus so it okay. was like and it's a, exactly the same technique so it's like the same people had decided that 
discretion was the better part of valor and um, mm -hmm. said, okay, well, we, I, I, I don't kill me. Um, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm shedding my monkish garb now, uh, mm -hmm. but I'm happy to go on being a metal worker. Okay. And you can see that Vikings are not stupid. I mean, they know that metal workers are pretty valuable people and mm -hmm. can make swords and all sorts of other things. So they start, and that metal working um, tradition, if you like, up uh, up near the beach that continued on uh, through the middle ages so there was a bit of a hiatus there was about there's about a hundred years where nothing much happened after this metalworking phase uh, during that time macbeth was leading the people of um, the murray firth against various uh, norse attempts to break through the uh, norse wanted to break through the Great Glen, so that they could connect up with the Isles, which uh, the Western Isles, which they were occupying. Um, and Macbeth is um, has terrible, you know, he has a really bad press. I think part, partly because of Shakespeare, really. I mean, <laughs> a, a guy you couldn't do anything right, but he practiced. He was he was probably as good as Alfred was against the Danes. Macbeth against the the Norse was pretty effective, mm -hmm. and he was a Scot rather than a Pict. The Picts really lost out in this clash of giants because the Scots from the West took on the Vikings and defeated them, or took on the Norse and defeated them in the Murray Firth area. And um, there was, penetration was quite slight. I mean, compared with something like the Danes in Yorkshire, there, there was a thing at Dingle and so on, but um, there's nothing like the same amount of um, Norse uh, material culture in that part, as, as, as you'd expect. So I think they pretty well gave up in the end and thought, oh, well, fine, Murray's going to go on resisting us. So they went round um, Shetland, Orkney, and then the Hebrides, and, and, then, and then down joining up with the, the Lancashire. You know, I, I think they, even though the first land is, is Perth is just a fjord, so it is attractive to the Scandinavians. Mm -hmm. It didn't seem to have penetrated, and Aberdeenshire, you know, kept very Viking-free, so to speak. So I think it was in, in a very interesting period. Um, and, and Macbeth, as I say, I think he's an unsung hero in many ways. He, <laughs> he, he did a lot of good defending. Yeah. Oh, before before we wrap up, I just wanted to pull back to the. The destruction of the the statues because am I am I right thinking that was quite unusual behavior in a in a raid because obviously it seems very deliberate to destroy I guess iconography statues rather than just stealing wealth kind of going out of your way to to destroy things. I don't know whether it's unusual. I, I think the problem with Port Mahomet is that it wasn't a documented monastery, and the documented monasteries. Um, really, and, and most of them survived in some way or another. Um, Port Mahomet had a long period of 100 years when not much happened there. And then when David I came to the throne, he was very influenced by a Roman Catholicism and uh, wanted to sort of join mainstream Europe in this. So he created a parish system, the, the whole box of tricks really put that the, the, the Catholics had, including new monasteries and so on. They did know that Port Mahomet was the port of St. Coleman, so they knew it. And they went and plonked their church on what I'm, I believe was the, uh, the sort of ruin of the eighth century church. Mm -hmm. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't continuity it was just the highest point at port marmok uh, has got a building on it uh, that's a church and people have been buried around it and now we're going to keep that going so they put a 12th okay then 12th century church on top of that and and um dedicated it to saint coleman so i i think they probably knew that there had been something there but hadn't been there for a bit and no one mm -hmm. quite remembered it on the other hand, interesting. I'll tell you just a final anecdote. In, in the final, in, in the medieval period, uh, the church goes on uh, being used for burial, but 
they're now burying more um, in the church, like they did with the, the monastery uh, with the monks. Um, and then outside the church, they put these big slabs or or um, you know, big they're the sort of big slabs with a with a set of initials, a Munro or a Mackenzie, and and a sword in outline. You can probably imagine the kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, those were the rich people that they were being uh, celebrated there. But in general, the 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 church was. Uh, uh, it was a scene of a battle between the Rosses and the, uh, and the Mackenzies. So Rosses are sort of Picts and the Mackenzies are sort of Scots from the West Coast. So in our analysis of the uh, stable isotopes, this, this was the period in which Westerners came in large quantities. It wasn't the ninth century, it was more like the 15th. Um, and so they were, they were kind of late into this area, but then it became Mackenzie land in a, in a big way. So mm -hmm. I think that um, make, makes it quite interesting, but we had a Mackenzie who was the, um, the uh, priest there, and um, he, was, he was buried in, in, the, in the church. And uh, we, we um, excavated his, his grave, and it's, it, was a, it was a fairly extraordinary thing. We also excavated the graves in the church because they had to be removed anyway for them to make the museum. And uh, right in front of the steps leading down to the crypt, there was a burial of a man um, uh, without a head, but um, he had four skulls, two placed each side of him. And then another person with a head had been placed on top of him. <laughs> so, oh. so this made this made the papers. Everyone thought, "Oh wow, what's going on here?" Then there's a Pictish head cult or something. I said, oh. <laughs> it's always a cult. It's yeah. always a cult. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. I said, it's sure, "Why not?" The pics are, are well and gone now. But but this, what we did was, um, <laughs> we went to um, David Wright. You know, in, everything. In, um, Harvard. Uh, and uh, he said, I'm interested in this, I'll, I'll do the, the DNA for you. So we did the DNA in all these skulls, and uh, as well as the standard operation, you know, standard archaeology procedure. So anyway, all these guys were related except one. So all these heads, they weren't superseding each other. They were simply um, being allowed into the tomb, which was occupying the, the pole position in the church, dead opposite the steps leading down to the relics oh. uh, in the crypt so uh, the the dna uh, was was really quite complicated but basically there was brothers uncles uh, um, nieces uh, and um, there was just this one other skull and this one other skull had a completely different carbon date to the others it came from the 8th century it was a pictish skull and uh, it had either been curated or they dug it up when they were digging their cemetery and thought, um, well, we seem to be missing one of these people that this, this, this one will do. <laughs> and, <you> know, <laughs> and so it, it was an extraordinary thing. It wasn't, it wasn't an outlandish cult. It was a family celebrating itself. And in, mm. a, in a time in the 15th century where there were a lot of clan wars going on, it was important mm -hmm. for them. Oh, wow. So there's lots of little stories at Port Mahomet like that. It was really a, a smashing place. Oh wow, sounds it. Well, thank you, thank you very much for for joining us. I I just tried to grab your book and then destroyed my little <laughs> shelf and threw drinks on the floor <laughs> trying to do it. I'm just gonna grab it. Well, <laughs> I've got I've got some cleaning up to do after this because I'm <laughs> throwing throwing everything everywhere. Um, but no, I wanted to grab it because I wanted to hopefully tell people to to go and buy it. Um, so it's your book, Paul Mahomet, Monastery, uh, Monastery of the Picts, which I've got here, which I'm, I'm going to read after this. Um, yeah, everyone just go and grab that book because uh, mine. this is the second time you've been on and it's always so much fun just to sit here. I think I say the least in your episodes than anybody else's because I get to just sit here and listen to you, to you speak. and. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it's fascinating. I just get lost listening to you tell your stories. Um, and I, yeah, I really enjoy it. You're welcome back anytime we can coax you in to speak about things. 
Well, I enjoy it too. Thanks very much. Ask me back in a few months when, when our ship is a bit further on and I'll tell you about the building of the Sutton Hoo ship. Oh, absolutely. That sounds yes. amazing. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, and I, I was going to ask as well whether would you be would you be the right person to speak to about York and Jorvik? Obviously, being in Huddersfield, I've been wondering about who would be the the best person to maybe reach out to try and get on to talk about that area. Because Richard Hall was the best person, and he died sadly um, a couple of years back. Mm -hmm. um, there's um, Steve Ashby in, in the Department of Archaeology. Um, he's pretty good. He's he's particularly good on the on the Viking period. Okay, wonderful. So, yeah, if you just drop it, he's called uh, well Steve Ashby, and uh, in the Department of Archaeology at York. I think it's a good place to start. Wonderful. Yeah, I will drop a I'll drop an email there and see. But yeah, you are welcome back anytime. When they like say in a few months, when the ship's a little bit further on, we'll uh, we'll talk again. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very so much. much, Brian. It's been an absolute Take pleasure. Care, Take care, see you later. See you. Bye. Perfect. All right. And if if you what a lovely guy. Every yeah. time he he's just the grandfather I wish I had. Uh, <laughs> fuck I I've wrecked my studio, I've thrown <laughs> water everywhere, coffee, my dear's skulls falling over. It's it's a nightmare. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. <laughs> I'm upset. <laughs> oh, no. Um, so if you enjoy the show, please sign up to Patreon to help me fix my studio because it's <laughs> fucked now. <laughs> now, if you if you enjoy the show, please, if you can, pop over to the Patreon uh, for the price of which you're buying us, one of us, a cup of coffee. The second tier is like buying both of us a coffee um, a month and you get to jump in and watch the episodes live or... You get a bonus episode. Um, all we try to do it every week. Unfortunately, life sometimes come up as this with taste having a, a young baby, but we try and get them in as much as possible. There's also a back catalog you can listen to of Q and ep Q and A episodes and story time episodes with Jonas Lorenzen. Um, so yeah, it's yeah, it, it really does help us out, keeps us going, helps us grow the the production and and get better. Helps us uh, put the food on the table for our awesome producer Shan. It does. It yes. does. Yeah, he'd be <laughs> he oh, he'd be struggling without us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I'm know sure. about that, man. But <laughs> I'm sure he'd be fine. I'm sure he'd have a more peaceful life, actually. But we... <laughs> no, if if you can, please go and check out. Like I say, it really helps us, um, and it's helped us grow to where we are. If you go back and listen to episode one compared to now, I, I hope that we're worlds apart. Um, somebody actually messaged me earlier and said, "Oh, I, you know, I love the podcast. I started from the beginning." And I, and I was like, "Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you had to get through those first twenty episodes of us not having a fucking clue what we were doing, bumbling around." <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, let's. Should we get out? Get out of here? Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining right. us today, everybody, and so, enjoy the rest of your day. Shall we